I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, from the hype to the reality, we're looking at 3D printing, a multi-billion dollar industry with a definite wow factor. But once the initial gloss wears off, what's driving growth? We speak to a biotech company that's actually printing hope for the future. Also this week, the Karachi crackdown, a troubled city and the government's attempt to take control will tell you why this city is so important to Pakistan's economy. And saving Malaysia's pygmy elephants, their habitats in danger from big business, so it may surprise you who's footing the bill for their sanctuary. Hello everyone, welcome to Counting the Cost. We want to do something a little different this week and basically flip the show on its head because you know there are plenty of economic headlines to talk about but we want to actually start this week with something of a good news story. 3D printing, you've probably heard of it, quite simply the process of creating something tangible, printing it from a digital design. It has the potential to be a personal manufacturing revolution, everyone having a 3D printer in their homes to create what they need. Though what did happen in the first instance was rather controversial. You might remember this, the American law student Cody Wilson, who in May of this year used a 3D printer to create a plastic gun, the Liberator, he called it. The blueprints that were posted online were then downloaded more than 100,000 times before the US government demanded they be removed. But strip away a controversy like that and you'll see many industries have been using the technology for some time. From airlines to autos, engineering to medicine, they've been using such printers for prototyping products and making parts that are no longer manufactured. In fact, last year the market for 3D printers and services was worth more than $2 billion, according to Walla Associates. It should top $6 billion by 2017 and expand to almost $11 billion by 2021. What you have to think about with 3D printing, though, is what it's capable of doing, what good it can do. And, you know, we found a company which is really using 3D technology for productive ends. It is actually using bioprinting technology to create, would you believe, living cells. The specialty area is breast cancer surgery. When a woman has uh, a tumour removed, what they're doing is creating customised implants and grafts as part of the reconstruction. The company is Tevito Bio Devices, and I'm delighted to say that the company's co-founder and CEO, Laura Bosworth, is joining us from Austin, Texas this week. And Laura, I need you to explain this for us, because when we talk about printing living things, I mean, <laughs> what kind of ink are you using there? Yes. It, is, it is very difficult to get your head around this. Please explain for, for our viewers. Well, it's, it, you know, it's an exciting technology, and really the ink is uh, a combination of cells. So in our case with Tevito, we're working with um, skin cells and fat cells mostly. And it's a mixture of that with um, a little bit of media that gives it some fluidity. Uh, and we have some other biomaterials uh, that we used uh, that are um, you know, part of our patented process. Mm. And that's, that's the ink. And we print on a, a hydro gel which is really the paper. And so it is much like a, a, a inkjet printer that you might have in your own home, much more sophisticated than that, but that's how it works. And how new is this technology, Laura? Because it's got this very um, futuristic feel to it. Uh, you know, and to me, it kind of seems like not just on the curve, but you know, well, well ahead of the curve, really. Well, 3D printing for, uh, has been probably in place since the early 70s for rapid prototyping. So uh, being able to build a model of a building for architects, uh, things like that so that you can kind of get a visual uh, perspective on it. So that itself has been around for a long time. What is relatively new is the printing of living cells. And uh, in fact, my co-founder has one of the first patents for the use of printing, bioprinting living cells. And I believe that was issued in 2006. So, you know, kind of at the, at the turn of that decade, the, the late 90s and the early 2000s. But that has been in research. Of course, you are running a business, Laura, so we have to talk about that side of things, the actual business side of things, uh, and, you know, the amount of money you have to put into this. And, and 
how well you can get funding because from everything you've described it sounds like it would be a very expensive business. Well, anytime you bring a medical product to market, it's fairly expensive. Uh, we are still in the relatively early stages moving out of research into uh, our product development. And so there is quite a bit of funding available for uh, that type of activity from uh, federal sources. There's a recognition that this type of investment can be quite costly. And, and so uh, there are research dollars that kind of jump start us and we are just in the phase of beginning to raise our um, equity that we need from investors to take this to market. And are investors easy or, or difficult to come by? I would think that investors should be looking at something like this and thinking, well, you know, it's real. It's not just printing for the sake of printing. It's, it's printing something that has a real positive impact. You know, they are super excited by uh, the work. Now, we are specifically working with products for breast reconstruction after breast cancer. Uh, and that disease touches so many women and so many people's fam uh, family, friends, and loved ones that it's a real, um, people can really connect with the need for this type of product. But as you mentioned, it is quite new, and so uh, investors are a little bit nervous, and, and we're really having to spend quite a bit of time with them, uh, get them comfortable with the technologies, get them comfortable with what it means to bring something like this to market. And are you subjected to the same rules and regulations of the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug, Drug Administration? Because uh, what you're doing is essentially creating something new and living, and I wonder if that, or how that is, watched over and regulated and kept in check? That is a great question. Uh, I like to think about it in two ways. 3D printing itself is really just a manufacturing process. And so that alone doesn't necessarily require significant change from the regulatory approach. What does start to get different is, you know, what types of cells are you using? Are, are, so it's kind of this living tissue that begins to be very interesting. And you know, today there are quite a few tissue engineered, that's what we call them, products in the market and that have been in the market probably since about the uh, 2000, 99 or 2000. Uh, a lot of them around skin that have, uh, have been produced. So it's, it's not completely new. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is if you're starting to use the patient's own cells, so in our case, uh, we would perform a liposuction and use the fat cells from the woman uh, to help create the implant. So it would be very natural. Um, and it's her own cells. So should that have a lot of regulation? You certainly want to be sure it's safe. Um, but the millions and millions of dollars, uh, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars that it often takes to bring things to market are, are probably not appropriate. So that is a bit of a new a new space to figure out how much do you need because it needs to be safe but y you don't want to shut down the competition and the creativity uh, in this new field because of uh, regulatory requirements. Which kind of leads into what I was going to ask you next and forgive me it's a terrible cliche here but is the sky the limit here? You know, The fact that you have machines and technology that can create things that you need and see fit is this sort of endless opportunities territory? You know, it really is, if you, th if you could open your vision to perhaps several decades out, there are still quite a few technical challenges. You know, where are you going to get the cells? Uh, there are groups today, there's a company here in the U.S. that is printing mini livers. There is a university in China that just, I, I want to say a month ago, announced that they're printing mini kidneys. Uh, so these are just the very first kind of baby steps in recreating the function. But those organs, kidneys and livers, are extremely sophisticated. So the, the, the biology behind what's happening there and really getting that to replicate so that we could grow a full liver organ, um, you know, that, that's still going to take a while. But yeah, the sky's the limit. I mean, I think we will get there. Laura Bosworth from Tevito Biodevices. This has been really absolutely fascinating talking to you. And we, we thank you for joining us this week on Counting the Cost. Thank you very much.
And still ahead on counting the costs when big business turns environmentalist. We're at the sanctuary to help protect Borneo's pygmy elephants. We turn to Pakistan now and a city which, and I was surprised to learn this myself, was once known as the Paris of the East. Karachi was a charming, bustling, cultural, economic hub, but it's fair to say those days are behind it. The megacity of 20 million people is now listed as the most dangerous in the world, with a murder rate said to be 25% higher than anywhere else. But you can't overplay Karachi's importance to Pakistan, economically speaking. It accounts for a third of the country's economic activity. But almost $8 million a day is lost in the black economy because of criminal activities. And really, Pakistan as a whole isn't in great financial shape. Last week, the International Monetary Fund approved a $6.6 .6 billion loan to Pakistan in response to a balance of payments crisis. That was the same day the government launched a crackdown in Karachi using paramilitary forces and police commanders. Well, we want to get some more detail on this from Adnan Afridi, uh, who is the head of strategy, is director of Silk Bank, and joining us from Karachi. And I wonder if you could tell us, first of all, about the old Karachi and, and what made it so important to Pakistan and its economy. Well, um, you know, I've grown up in Karachi and lived here for, for most of my life. And, and, and the Karachi of my youth was very, very different uh, in that uh, it was always, of course, the commercial and capital uh, hub of, of the country. But it was also a, a great city to live in uh, where you could ride a bike, uh, you could uh, go out at night. It was, as you uh, well know, the city of lights. Uh, and I think all that contributed to the commercial vibrancy uh, of the city and added to its, uh, uh, to its growth. Uh, unfortunately, the Karachi of today is, is very different. Uh, uh, my children, uh, uh, who are young, uh, are seeing a very, very protected and sheltered life compared to, to what I saw. Uh, uh, they are not allowed to go out, uh, outside the house. Uh, taking them to school is an adventure in of itself. And I think that has all contributed to the psyche of all of us who have invested our professional and capital careers in the city. Uh, and, and I think that in turn is taking its toll on, on the commercial viability of the city. So in, in your opinion then, basically what went wrong? At what point did Karachi really start to go downhill? Uh, it is difficult, of course, uh, to, to pinpoint any specific incident. Uh, however, uh, I believe that over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, the, the demographics of the city uh, have, have changed dramatically. There has been a, a vast influx of both internal uh, 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 sort of labor migration from the north. Uh, we've had, of course, refugees from, from the, across the border from Afghanistan, which have settled in the city. Uh, and I think that commingling process has gone on unchecked. Uh, uh, and, and that has now uh, led to uh, a vast urban, uh, urban problem where uh, uh, which other cities, of course, have faced as well when it comes to disputes over land settlement, mafias, uh, uh, gang wars. Uh, but I think in Karachi, that, that problem has compounded with the war against terror that Pakistan has been facing. And I think uh, that combination has been particularly explosive uh, for Karachi. So I think it is, uh, it is a lack of governance or misgovernance or bad governance, I suppose, combined with very dangerous demographics that have led to this. So tell me then about an average business or an average business day, if such a thing actually exists in Karachi, I'm not <laughs> sure it does. You know, the sorts of struggles that people have to go through on a daily basis to go about their business to, to earn a living. As, as you would know, covering financial markets or, you know, my, my uh, career was uh, previously associated with the stock exchange. And I think financial markets, as you know, certainty uh, is extremely important. And I think one thing that investors or businessmen shy away from is unpredictability. And unfortunately, Karachi is the hallmark of that. Any given morning or evening, uh, uh, you know, you get out of bed and you are going to work and uh, you will not know whether you will be able to uh, take your usual route to the office or to the factory uh, and vice versa in the evening. I'll give you a personal anecdote 
of less than 24 hours ago. Uh, I had an urgent meeting scheduled for Dubai. Uh, and uh, uh, just as I was about to leave for the airport, the city shut down uh, due to a, a, a killing uh, uh, of a, of a well-known political activist. Uh, and therefore, I had to take a flight of 5 in the morning as opposed to 10 in the evening to make my early morning uh, meeting. But I think all of us who live in Karachi perhaps have become uh, uh, somewhat used to this and, and, and tend to be desensitized. However, I think if one was to look at this rationally, uh, uh, then uh, this is not an appropriate way to conduct our daily lifestyles and certainly not an appropriate way to, to conduct long-term uh, business and investment decisions. Are you confident then that the Pakistani government gets it, that it knows how, how bad the situation is in Karachi and that it's actually taking the right steps to assist businesses there and to help the economy along? Well, the current government is about 100 days old, uh, so I think it would be unfair of, of me to, to pass uh, judgment. I think it is too early. Uh, however, uh, I would say that the early signs are encouraging. Uh, I think this government, compared to, to previous governments, has, has at least uh, uh, brought Karachi in the forefront uh, of the national debate. Uh, the Prime Minister has, has visited the city and has, uh, and has made law and order the, a, a central point of, of the discourse, both in the cabinet as well as, of course, in the media uh, as a subsequent to that. So I think that is a good start. Uh, the government certainly gets it. Uh, I think all governments get it. Uh, Karachi is too important uh, to ignore. Unfortunately, uh, getting it and doing something about it are two different things. And you need both the political will uh, as, well as, the, uh, as well as the governance infrastructure uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be able to actually do something about it. And, and today we are faced with a particularly challenging issue in that the government of Sindh is different to the government at the center, and it remains to be seen how smoothly the two will be able to work together uh, uh, towards the betterment of Karachi. Just, just briefly, and uh, you, you, you reminisced, and it was really nice at the start of this interview uh, about the Karachi of your youth. It was, it was nice to hear that sort of thing. Do you think it can get back to that, or some sort of modern equivalent? I think most of us who live in Karachi are optimists, and that's probably part of the reason we are still here. I think, uh, uh, of course, many of us are here by choice, and, and, and that shows that we have the confidence and belief that this city has shown its resilience in the past, continues to show it today, uh, and I think there is a bright future for this city if it is given a little bit of help uh, uh, along the parameters that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I certainly do believe that, uh, uh, that it is possible. Uh, however, uh, I think it is the people of the city who will have to, to a certain extent, take matters in their own hands uh, to make sure that the city becomes viable for, for our children and certainly beyond that. Adnan Afridi, lovely to talk to you and get all that, uh, that personal insight on Karachi. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And now to the economic headline that I alluded to earlier, arguably one of the most closely watched financial decisions of the year, in fact. It was one, though, that surprised many when the U.S. Federal Reserve decided it wasn't going to stop stimulating the economy just for now. The argument was that, quite simply, U.S. unemployment and growth were weaker than hoped. Now, in a nutshell, the Fed's been propping up the economy by buying mortgage and treasury bonds. Banks and financial institutions could then use that money to loan out to businesses and consumers. Has it helped, though? Well, it's fair to say banking profits have soared. In the first three months of this year, they earned $40.3 billion, a record. But unemployment's still bleak, and we mentioned this last week. 2.2 million jobs are still needed to get back to pre-crisis levels. While for those who do have jobs, average household incomes have fallen for the fifth consecutive year to around $51,000. Overseas, though, and QE, quantitative easing, as this stimulating is known, has powered economic growth in emerging markets from Brazil to Indonesia. In fact, in the first three months of this year, cross-border bank lending to emerging markets rose by $267 billion to $3.4 trillion. They'll be pleased with this Fed decision because all the indications was that it was going to fall back on QE, and that had seen a trillion dollars flood out of those emerging markets, sending currencies to multi-year lows. Paddy Calhane in Washington, D.C. has more now on this latest turn of economic events. 
A small desk, the setting for what was expected to be a big economic announcement from the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke. It was expected to impact the world economy, but he changed course. And to make no change in either its asset purchase program. Translation, the U.S. Central Bank will continue printing money, spending $85 billion a month to buy U.S. bonds and securities. They had been expected to scale back, but Bernanke says the U.S. isn't creating enough jobs. And with the continuing fight between the president and Republicans in Congress and the possible consequences, the Fed will wait. It, it, it is the case, I think, that uh, a government shutdown and perhaps even more so a um, failure to raise the debt limit uh, could have very serious consequences for the uh, financial markets and for the economy. And the Federal Reserve's policy is to do whatever we can to keep the, pol to keep the economy on course. <laughs> What that means, the dollar will stay weak, and economists say that helps developing economies. Right now, this is near-term good news for the developing markets because U.S. interest rates are staying low, so the U.S. will continue to be, you know, kind of, kind of like a lawn blower uh, blowing cash towards the BRICS uh, rather than the reverse. The BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are already feeling the effects of even the talk of change. Money and currencies started moving. In a new poll, 900 investors were asked to pick one or two countries which would be the worst investment opportunities next year. 25% said Brazil, 24% Russia. India fared the worst of all, 35% saying they wouldn't put their money there. 23% said China. The developed countries did much better. The news out of Washington could halt the destabilizing impact on the developing world, for now. Thank you. But Bernanke has made it clear the policy is going to change. It's just a question of when. Finally this week, a sanctuary for orphaned pygmy elephants, which has opened in Malaysia. Now, I admit this wouldn't usually be a business story. There's a bit of controversy here because activists are saying it's the very industry which harms the elephant's natural environment that's actually paying for the sanctuary. Andrew Thomas reports now from Sabah State in Borneo. Take away the people and she's alone. So far, the only pygmy elephant at the Malaysian state of Sabah's first rescue sanctuary. The expectation, though, is that there'll be as many as 50 injured elephants joining Miss Rocco, company for her, but that demand is a worrying sign of the threats to Sabah's wildlife. The center was officially opened by a government minister, but it's mainly money from the palm oil industry that's paying for it. The very industry, some accuse, of doing more to damage wildlife than any other. You're the main sponsor of this project. Mm -hmm. Is your involvement part of a guilty conscience? Definitely not, definitely not. Uh, what we have done is that real, uh, you know, there's a realization that we cannot live in isolation. I think uh, it's a realization that we should be part of the overall effort. It is still possible to see striking wildlife down the Kinabatanyan River, though the chance of seeing an elephant in the wild is highly unlikely. There are thought to be fewer than 2,000 left. No one quite knows how many there once were. Loss of habitat is to blame. First it was logging, then rubber. Now what were once rainforests are palm oil plantations. They cover 20% of the entire state of Sabah. Around the Kinabatanyan River, that proportion rises to 85%. For kilometre after kilometre after kilometre, this is all you see. Palm oil trees. Its fruit and their seeds are crushed, processed, and the oil used in hundreds of thousands of products. From the air, you see the scale. At ground level, the trucks rumble by with relentless predictability. Sometimes animals are not just pushed out, but hurt. 14 pygmy elephants were found dead in January. It's suspected they ate bait poison to kill smaller animals considered pests on the plantations. One baby survived. He's been named Joe and now lives in a zoo where he'll probably be till he dies. There are other threats too. Trunks, legs get caught by hunting snares. Not meant for elephants, but they go into the snares and they cause horrific uh, injuries. Uh, and basically it's a slow death for this elephant. So this sanctuary is actually for this, for this group of elephants. Financial support for this sanctuary is welcome. But even those in the palm oil industry say in the past they've been part of the problem. 
And that is our show for this week, but there is more for you online at aljazeera.com slash business. The latest business headlines are there. Also, all of our previous episodes for you to catch up on. Uh, you can get in touch quite easily as well. Tweet either me at Kamal AJE, our business editor at Abid Oliver Ali, or drop us an old-fashioned email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Thank you.